Hi, everyone. This is Becky Shiring, and I'm Cheryl Sherwin. Hopefully, we have the audio issues resolved. <laughs> but uh, we're very happy to have you all here for Total Participation Techniques. Um, and today, we're going to talk to you about cognitively engaging your ELLs in the classroom. Um, and following our presentation today, there will be a discussion on the Lynx Adult ELL and Assessment Groups from November 11th to the 13th. So if you find that you have questions um, that we aren't able to address today, you can feel free to post those questions on the Lynx discussion board. And this is us, since there's no video. <laughs> Um, so I'm the PD Specialist and Instructional Coach at Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School, and I work with teachers here just to um, help them improve their classroom instruction. And I have been an ESL teacher here at Carlos Rosario for the past 17 years. Uh, started out teaching the lower levels, beginning um, levels, and uh, have been teaching the intermediate levels now for the, the past uh, two years. Um, and so just a little bit of context about where we're coming from. So um, we both work at Carlos Rosario International Public Charter School, which is a fantastic uh, school in Washington, D.C. And we serve the adult, um, the adult immigrant community of Washington, D.C. And we were actually the first public charter school for adults in the entire nation. Um, and just as a side note, there was a really interesting discussion last week on the program management, the Lynx Program Management Group all about adult ed charter schools and what they are. Um, and our executive director and CEO, Allison Kokoro, was participating in that discussion. So if you're interested in learning more, you can go find out about that on the program management group. Um, and so currently, um, at Carlos Rosario, we have 10 different levels of ESL, starting from basically pre-literacy pre all the way up to level 8, um, which is an advanced level. And then we also offer career training programs in culinary arts, computer support specialists, and nurse aid training. We have GED in English and Spanish. Um, we have a citizenship class, computer literacy. And then a really big part of what we do to help our students um, be successful and to persist is we offer them comprehensive supportive services through counseling and um, career help as well. So probably a lot of you guys are familiar with that clip from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, but we chose to show this to you because this is an example of the um, exact thing you do not want to see in your classroom. The students were not engaged. There was no evidence in, of learning. People were falling asleep. We didn't see any higher order thinking. And there was tremendous amounts of teacher talk time versus student talk time. So um, let this be an example of what you don't want. So. Um, this summer, I read this really great book called Total Participation Techniques, and it talks about how we can increase every student's cognitive engagement, um, and this is by Persida and William Himmeley. And I read this this summer, and I came back ready to start the school year in August with our teachers, and I just love the techniques that were in the book, so I decided to offer it as a professional development session here at our school. And um, everybody just really grabbed onto these techniques and loved them because they were so simple and they got everybody involved in the learning. Um, and so I would love the opportunity today to share them with everyone on a wider scale. So that was basically just giving you a quick background as to what TPTs are. Um, and so today our goal really is to get your students to go from this to this. Um, and we have a few goals that we're going to, to try to accomplish today. We want to connect your classroom participation and higher order thinking. So not just getting your students involved, but getting them cognitively involved. Um, we're going to demonstrate six total participation techniques for you. There are 37 total in the book, but we just um, chose a few. And then we're going to discuss why TPTs are beneficial for ELLs. And then you're going to think about how you might apply this to your own context. Um, 
So first, let's make the connection between PPTs and higher order thinking. So this is a quote from the book. The use of higher order thinking is what takes students beyond simple engagement and ensures that students are cognitively engaged. So um, it's great when students are engaged um, and having fun, but really as teachers, it's our responsibility to make sure that that learning is happening at a higher level as well. So um, this is a graphic from the book, and it's, the, it's uh, basically a quadrant analysis of cognitive engagement. And this really helps you to visualize the connection between participation and higher order thinking. Um, so all of these quadrants might be present in your teaching, but it's really important that we continuously shift back to quadrant four. That's where we want to spend a lot of our time. Um, so in quadrant one, we have low cognition and low partic participation. Quadrant two is low cognition, high participation. Quadrant three is high cognition, low participation, and our ultimate goal is quadrant four, high cognition and high participation. Okay, so just um, to help us get a little more familiar with the quadrants, I want you to, we're going to do a little exercise and I want you to consider the following. So Mrs. Monsana is a teacher and she's teaching a lesson about job interviewing. And she begins the lesson by showing students a video of a good and bad job interview. What quadrant is she in? And you can go ahead and um, type your answer in the chat box. Okay, so those of you that said one are correct because basically there's where is the evidence that our students are learning? They're, they're passive recipients by watching a video. And students aren't participating. They're just watching a video. Um, so that would be an example of quadrant one. So let's consider the next situation. In this one, um, our teacher, Mrs. Manzana, now ask partners to talk to each other and create a list of the good and bad interview behaviors in the video. So in this scenario, um, could you type in for us, please, what quadrant, quadrant do you think Mrs. Manzano's class is in uh, in this situation? Okay, so if you said quadrant two, you are correct. Quadrant two is the fun but forgettable quadrant. Um, students are all engaged because they're talking, but at this level, they're only identifying. And identifying is a lower order thinking skill. Um, so, and one thing I've noticed as I'm watching teachers here in, in our school implementing these PPTs um, is that a lot of our teachers have sort of been easing into them and staying in quadrant two which is really great because all students are participating and they're, um, they're engaged in the class, but we need to make sure that we're pushing them and moving beyond identifying and defining and really into that evaluation um, piece, into the higher order thinking. Okay, so the next scenario. Mrs. Mansana now calls on individual students to name a good behavior or a bad behavior and explain why the behavior was good or bad. What quadrant do you think she's in? Okay, so those of you that said quadrant three are correct. Um, basically, in this activity, only the students that are participating are benefiting. Those students that are um, sitting quietly are not benefiting from this activity. So it's still higher order thinking, but we don't have all students participating. All right, and so our final scenario, um, we have the individual students uh, complete a, one of the, the basic PPTs, which is called a quick write. Uh, and that would have been done differently from the job inter interviewer in the video. So students share their responses with a partner, and then finally every student writes a job interview tip on the, the whiteboard. So in this case, 
Again, emphasis on the point, every student writes a job interview tip on the whiteboard. What quadrant would the Mrs. Manzana's class be in now? Okay, so everybody's getting this one. <laughs> We're in quadrant four, right? Every student is engaged and every student is demonstrating their learning and they're evaluating. They're evaluating and comparing what they would have done differently and then creating a tip from that for their classmates. Um, so now you can sort of see the difference between what does one, two, three, and four look like. Um, and, you know, sort of here's the connection between the quadrants and bloom. So on the lower end of the pyramid, you know, you have your basic recall skills, describing, labeling, summarizing. And these are really necessary to start students out when you're starting with a new concept. But the idea is to build on these and move into defending, evaluating, creating, um, analyzing these higher order skills. And so we want to make sure that we're doing that where all students are participating um, in quadrant four. So we're going to go ahead and move right into the techniques now. Um, and so the principle behind all of the techniques is something called the ripple effect. And this comes from the book. Um, and basically the way it works is if you imagine if you threw a stone into a pond, um, the way that the, the ripple happens. So the very first plunk when you throw the stone in is the teacher's question and the student's individual response. So the student has time to answer themselves, either in their head or on a piece of paper. After the student has had individual processing time, then the students share their ideas in pairs or small groups. And that would be that next ripple out from the stone. And then the smaller ripples as we move outward is sort of the whole class conversation um, about these ideas. So starting with the individual and spreading out like a ripple in a pond. So one of the, the, again, one of the more basic um, PPTs that, uh, that we have been using um, since Becky introduced uh, this idea to us is what's called the Think, Pair, Share, uh, which is probably familiar to um, some of you already. Uh, and we're going to add into that, uh, at that part where it's uh, the think part, uh, we're going to add an additional PPT, which the book calls a quick write. And I think what's so significant about uh, this PPT is that we know that uh, every student uh, needs an opportunity to process an answer. And I think as teachers, sometimes uh, we, when we pose a question and students don't answer right away, we interpret that as possibly they're not understanding. Uh, when in fact their silence is actually um, representing their, their processing. So we, we tend to get a little anxious or, or nervous when they're not responding when in fact they, they are processing, which we all know is really important. And this is particularly important for ELL students who are not only processing the ideas but are also processing uh, the language as well. So a nice way to handle that think part is uh, what's called the quick write, uh, which students take out a little piece of paper or in their notebook or a sticky note, and you give them two minutes, three minutes, um, a defined time to just have a chance to organize their ideas. Uh, and then once uh, they have had a chance to organize their ideas, they're going to turn to their neighbor and they're going to discuss their ideas together. So obviously that's the pair and the share part. Um, and I would just go ahead and echo what Cheryl is saying that, um, and really emphasize the time piece is very, very important. I think as teachers we often pose a question and expect a response right away. Um, but that's not the way it should work. We really need to make sure that we have some wait time built in there for our students to, to think about it really think about what you're asking. And I think the, uh, the share part gives uh, students an opportunity to kind of test out their ideas and especially for those students that might be a little shy or might not be inclined to be the volunteers in the class, 
Uh, so it gives them that opportunity to bounce their ideas off of um, another another student, which which makes it a little safer before they move out into uh, sharing with the class. Um, and each each of our uh, methods that we show you today have sort of a career and college connection with them. And this one would be allowing students to communicate through listening and engaging in conversation with a variety of different people. So the chalkboard flash is uh, another TPT, and uh, this is uh, started with, starts with a, a teacher, the teacher posing a question. And uh, because our emphasis, of course, in, in this activity or these exercises is to promote higher order thinking skills, uh, you, you want to make that question uh, something that makes them think a little bit and not just a simple yes or no question, but perhaps more of a, a why type of question or a how type of question. And so the students uh, write their answers to the question on um, a small piece of paper or, again, a sticky note, uh, again, giving them that time to process and to think, uh, and then uh, posting that piece of paper up on a, a board uh, so that uh, they, the other students in the class can see what uh, their, co uh, their classmates are writing. Um, and then that also can take you to uh, the, the higher level aspect of this which is taking all of the ideas from the students and then uh, sorting them into what was similar, what was different, and then were there any surprises that the students noticed. Um, and so through this activity, students are able to analyze different viewpoints and noticing similarities and differences. They can explain their ideas and pose questions to other classmates, all critical skills for career in college. Um, and I'll point out, too, that the similarities, differences, and surprises piece is a really key uh, point or key part of this technique in getting students to the higher order of thinking. Um, and so these are some pictures from a classroom from one of our teachers, Michelle. Um, and so you can see in the top left corner, students uh, watched a video about, uh, I think it was about World War II. And then the students had to write a sentence um, summarizing something that they saw. Um, as a quick write, basically. And then the students got up and posted their ideas on the board, as you can see in the pictures. And then they read each other's ideas um, and discussed what they noticed. The other piece, there was a grammar connection to this as well. The students were working on adjectives and adverbs. So the students had to also identify and list adjectives and adverbs from all of the students, um, their classmates' sentences, and list them on the board. And then from there, they took the list of adjectives and adverbs and sorted them into adjective or adverb and then created sentences with them, too. So there's lots of ways that you can sort of integrate grammar and reading and writing and all of these things into the PPT. Uh, so this has turned out to be a, a very popular PPT with, with my class, and it involves uh, putting numbers on, well, the book says to put a number on uh, the, the chairs in the classroom. And I think, as you can see from the picture, uh, most of us at this point, instead of having our desks arranged in uh, rows, we have them grouped together in groups of four. And the book says to put numbers on the back of the chair. Uh, <laughs> however, I found that uh, chairs tend to roll around and move to different desks. So that when you're ready to do this the next time, you've got uh, three fours at one desk and no twos. So I ended up putting the numbers on the desks themselves, and, and that's been working much better. So the idea is that uh, every wherever the student sits, that student has a number. And then you the teacher assigns the task. And it could be, again, a quick write. It could be uh, a think, pair, share. But uh, before the students become engaged, the teacher uh, will explain to them that after they've had a chance to, to process their, sent their answers or to discuss their ideas, uh, when it's done, the teacher will call out a number, one, two, three, or four, 
and whoever has that number, whoever's sitting at that desk, will be responsible for reporting out. So the idea is that everybody uh, goes into the activity uh, on an equal footing with an equal chance of being called on. Uh, so it's not a matter of volunteering, and it's not a matter of the teacher choosing a particular student, uh, but how, but whoever has the number that's chosen randomly. And I uh, went online and found a, an online spinner and have been using that. And it's, it's simply, are we going to have? Yeah, they're going to. Okay. okay. So you just click on the spinner, and and then it uh, chooses the the number. And again, the whole I think it takes again the pressure off of any of the students who are shy. Uh, everybody's um, up there with the, the same opportunity to be called on or not called on, and somehow that's just made. Uh, plus, it adds a little bit of suspense <laughs> as the spinner is going around. And it just adds a, an additional layer of um, bells and whistles and, and, and enjoyment. Uh, but the, those students who are, are chosen uh, seem to be quite ready to, to present and to share out. Uh, so it's proved to be extremely uh, successful. And with the, the numbers already on the table, uh, you might not think of it beforehand when you're doing your lesson. Uh, but uh, the lesson might develop, and you're thinking, oh, we could just uh, do a quick uh, numbered heads PPT right now, and everything's already in place, and you can go ahead and do the TPT without too much advanced thinking or planning. And I think that's true with a lot of these PPTs. I mean, really, you only need a scrap piece of paper for a quick write or for a sync pair share. You don't need anything. Um, and so they're just really easy to just integrate right into your lessons that you're already doing. Um, okay, so hold up to our next one. And again, a, 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 um, an idea that maybe some of us have already been using, um, and this is one where it's uh, I've posted some multiple choice questions um, up on the board, and the students have their colored cards in front of them, and we're going to talk about the, the little boxes that are on each set of tables. Uh, so these are little cards that you can have in the in your materials box or your toolbox, and just pull them out, and students can um, respond to the multiple choice. And it's great, of course, for the teacher because you can get uh, a really nice snapshot of um, how students are uh, doing with these particular types of questions. Whether most of them are getting them correct, and you can see who's not getting them correct. Uh, but then the added part to this is for, again, you can call on a student by number at the table and ask them to explain why they chose uh, the answer that they did. Yeah, that's a really, really key piece. And uh, thinking back to when I was in the classroom, I used to do hold-ups all the time, you know, true, false, and ABCD for review questions. Um, but that was a key piece that I always left out, was asking the why. And the why is really what, what pushes our students thinking into that quadrant four. Um, and so the book outlines a lot of different types of holdups. So like Cheryl said, this is a ABCD um, holdup. But the book also has um, this template, which is true, not true, true with modifications, and unable to determine. So these will lend themselves really well, I think, to um, particular reading. Um, and asking, you know, questions about or comprehension questions about reading. Um, also, if you address numeracy concepts in your class, you can do numbered cards. So the one on the left would be sort of a laminated hundreds chart where students can circle their answers with um, dry erase markers, and then the one on the right would be just numbers that they could hold up because um, we know how important numeracy is for our students as well. Okay, so the next one we're going to talk about is a debate carousel. In the book, it's debate carousel, but um, one of our teachers here used it, and she decided to call it debate circle because she thought our students would understand circle better than carousel. Um, 
And so the way that the debate uh, circle or debate carousel works is that you create a prompt that requires students to take a position on something. So they have to give their opinion about, um, about something. And then there's a template that you would distribute that I'm going to show in a minute. Um, and students would, it's um, broken up into boxes, four boxes. And students would write their opinion in the first box. Actually, I'll just go ahead and show it. It's probably easier that way. Um, so the students would write their opinion in the first box and explain why. So always explaining the why. Then after the time limit was up, the students would pass their paper to the person sitting next to them. And the person sitting next to them would have to add another reason that would support the first opinion. Even if they don't agree, they still have to take a supporting role, which is really forcing them to push their thinking. Um, and then the, the paper would be passed to a third student who needs to read opinions one and two and write an opposing argument. And then finally, on to a fourth student where um, that student reads what was written in the three boxes and then gives their own opinion and their own reason. And then the students come back together and they share their thoughts with each other and as a whole class. Um, and this is helping our students with writing arguments and coming up with claims to support arguments um, for, for their opinion. Um, so I'm going to show you a way that it was actually modified by one of our teachers, Laura Clawson. And um, so I was working with her, and she was trying to think through an activity for teaching however and although, which probably could be a pretty dry topic um, in many classes. And she said, you know, I really want to do something that's engaging to the students. So I said, well, what about that debate circle activity? Maybe let's try something there. So with her, we developed this template um, where basically students work in a team of three. And Laura posed a question. And then the student, um, or posed a scenario, I should say. And the student had to give their opinion. And then they pass the paper to student two, and the student had to use however and give their opposing opinion. And then finally, student three would give um, their own opinion using although. So here's an example. It might be a little hard to read, but um, the scenario she gave them was a lawyer comes to your home to give you his or her services, but you didn't call him or her. Um, what should you do? And so. Um, you can see the first student said it's best to say, I don't have any problems and nobody called you. And then the second student said, well, can I see your ID? Um, and then the third student decided, oh, it's better if you just disappear from my house. <laughs> um, and I see a question in the chat box, can we get the templates? And I will make sure that the templates are available to you. Um, I can share them through the link um, discussion board. And here's another example. So in this situation, it's best to listen to him or her. Um, however, you could just say that you didn't call him or her and then close the door. Um, and so they were really able to write their opinions using the, the key grammar point. And then following that, what Laura did was she gave the students sentence stems to discuss their opinions about this topic. And surprisingly, the class was actually divided as to whether or not they should talk to this lawyer. <laughs> um, but so they were able to use these sentence stems to practice the target grammar point and state their own opinion. It was a really, really great lesson. Um, and this is a quote from Laura, who said, the debate circle activity was a great strategy to engage students in ways that spark their own opinions, while also getting them to use the grammar point of focus. The integration of grammar with critical thinking served as an excellent balance. Getting adult students to immerse themselves in an activity is sometimes challenging, but because this exercise was interesting to them, they were eager to jump right in and do the task. And this is why students respond so well to total participation techniques, because while being challenged, they are active and doing a variety of tasks. Um, I have this really funny, I, I don't know, like like a meme or something like that that says, um, that was a great worksheet, said no student ever. And I think this is an example of that. I mean, how often do we give our students however and all the worksheet drills when we could really do an activity like this and engage our students and allow them to 
to give their own opinions on a topic as well. So we're going to uh, move away a little bit from uh, topics specifically in the, uh, the book, the TCT book, uh, but with the same ideas in mind of having students uh, work collaboratively and uh, engage in higher order thinking skills. So we've been working on uh, trying to incorporate uh, lessons within the context of different themes or different topics. And uh, this is something that's going to be formally introduced into my intermediate level next year, but we decided to test it out uh, this semester to see how, how it would go. And so we chose the theme of early American history. And uh, we were doing lots of reading activities and writing activities and grammar and speaking all within the context of colonial life and early American history around the Revolutionary War and some of the, the leaders that emerged um, around that time period. And the, the students, uh, the final or culminating project, uh, the students had to choose a topic and we gave them a list to, to work from, although also gave them the flexibility of choosing their own as long as it was within the bounds of the, of the theme itself. And, and then they had to collaborate to create a, uh, a poster presentation. And with Becky's help and advice, uh, we decided to use uh, an online program called Padlet, padlet.com, where the students can uh, post pictures and videos and, and text and links and, and all different types of media. So uh, what you're seeing here uh, are some of the, the final projects of some of our students. Uh, so the idea was that they, they chose their topic uh, and then uh, they had to decide uh, who was going to take uh, the responsibility for the different parts. So we gave them the, uh, the spec to, to, um, to complete the project. So they had to include at least uh, one video, uh, one link to a, a website, uh, two quotes, and uh, five interesting facts. And that was the minimum. Oh, and two pictures, two pictures. So basically, uh, when they undertook the task, one person was responsible for uh, the technology part, setting up the board. And then they began uh, dividing up the responsibilities. Um, and again, we gave them some language to use because one of the things that we're, we're overlaying on uh, our classes and our curriculum are soft skills. And how do you work in teams? How do you talk to people in teams? How do you collaborate effectively? And uh, so we gave them lots of uh, language stems to work from. Uh, and then uh, time each day uh, within the class, the time period, to, to work on their presentation. Uh, and then they actually had to stand in front of the class and, and present. And it was uh, an astounding success. Uh, we, the students did a self-evaluation at the end. And with the exception of one person who said it was an OK uh, way to learn, Everybody else said they, they really enjoyed this type of learning experience. And the comment, uh, my favorite comment, one of the students, when I told the students this was our last presentation, one of the students said, great, when are we going to do the next one? So they were totally engaged uh, in the topic and the idea of, uh, of working together to produce a product that they were all very, very proud of. Yeah, and so the idea here, I mean, I love love project-based learning. And just by nature, uh, it is a total participation technique because every student had a role um, and they were expected to participate. And they were responsible for sort of synthesizing all of this information that they had gotten over the course of how long was it? Uh, about six weeks. Six weeks of readings. They even took a field trip. And so they had to really take a look at all of this information and then pull out the most important pieces and then present it to the class as well. And we also, in terms of the higher order thinking skills, um, in, in addition to summarizing and 
and uh, presenting or what they felt was most important, they also had to uh, explain or justify why they chose uh, certain quotes or certain pictures. Uh, so they had to, yeah, they had to justify why they chose something, not just what it was. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you don't have access to technology in your context, you could easily do this with just poster board as well. Um, it could work that way too. Um, okay, so now we want to just take a, a quick little um, check-in with you guys. And I want you all, in one word, to tell us what effect would the use of these techniques have on your classroom and your students. Don't do it in the chat box, though. <laughs> I see everybody's typing. I, I found this really, really cool tool called Answer Garden. Um, so we're going to use that. So here is the link to the Answer Garden. And it's also um, in the chat box as well. So go to Answer Garden, and in one word, 20 characters or less, what, um, what effect would this have? And we'll see how the tool works. There we go. If you refresh the screen, you can see um, new answers as they're arriving if you're doing this on your, on your computer um, at your desk. Okay, so we can see engagement is, is a big um, response, participation, energizing, enthusiasm, community building, I love that one, freshness, student-centered, these are all really great. And I think, um, you know, the TPTs have all of these effects on students. Greater confidence. Um, all right, cool. So also, just as a little bonus, that is a really cool tool that's very, very easy to use that you can use with your students um, in the classroom, and it's called Answer Garden. Very easy to set up. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the connection between TPTs and ELLs um, and why they are beneficial for ELLs. And some of those things that you guys just said in your Answer Garden and your Word Cloud are some things that we're going to um, address. Okay, so one of the key benefits is that it allows students processing time. So all students need processing time, but I think this is especially true with our ELLs. They have to think in a language that's not their own. Um, so, you know, the, the TPTs allow them that time to really think through the language that they're going to use. Um, these TPTs are also low risk and not in the spotlight. So by allowing the student processing time and allowing the student to answer the question on their own and then share with a buddy or share with the person sitting next to you, it's not like I'm calling out a student in front of everyone um, on the spot, but they've got time to really gather their thoughts. Um, these are real confidence builders too because like, you know, we've said before, it gives students the opportunity to practice their language in a safe place first. So with a partner or in a small group before they might speak out in front of the class. And by doing that successfully, you know, it's building their confidence and their, you know, every day they have opportunities to use this language and have these small wins to where they can finally feel confident maybe using it outside of the classroom as well. Um, these PPTs are really great for building class communities. So students are always, uh, by nature of these activities or these techniques, students are always engaged in conversation with each other. They're engaged in conversations about their opinions um, and their thoughts. Um, you know, they're forced to work together in groups a lot, which, which builds community.
Um, so all students participate and no one goes quietly unnoticed. I know how easy it is as a teacher to call on the students that are the most vocal and um, it's hard to make sure that every student is participating in class every day. You miss students, it's just the way it works. Um, but with TPTs, the expectation is that student, everyone is participating and the way that the, the techniques are set up every student has to participate, um, so no one is getting missed. Um, and they target all of our skills, reading, writing, speaking, listening, and they often target all of these skills in the same, with the same technique. So for example, quick write, you are, um, maybe you're responding to a reading, and so you're writing your opinion, and then you're speaking to your partner, and then you're listening to your partner. So you've really got a nice um, whole, lesson or whole technique that includes all four areas. They allow you to differentiate in multi-level classrooms. So for example, with a quick write, um, if you set a two minute time limit for a student to respond to a question, you know, some students, all of our classrooms are multi-level classrooms, and so some of our students that are more advanced might write four or five sentences well, some of the students that struggle a little bit might only get one or two sentences, and that's fine. I, I'd love to, uh, I, I'm reading some of the chat uh, comments that are scrolling by, and I see that one of the concerns is about how these work with uh, lower level students. And um, I think the thing to keep in mind is that they are easily adaptable. Uh, and you could see, for example, how uh, the template with the opinions, uh, Laura adapted it to uh, and, and just made it a little uh, more um, in line with uh, her level of students, uh, kind of pared it down a little bit. Uh, for in my example of the, of the chalk splash, uh, the example with the pictures that we showed was uh, of the classroom that's one level higher than mine where she actually did have them sorted into uh, similarities, differences, and surprises. Uh, I actually did not do that type of sorting uh, because I didn't think my students were quite ready for it at this point. Uh, but I did have them explain uh, why they had the answer that they, they did. Uh, and we, we talked about some of the answers that were presented. So I think in, in every case, uh, with, a, with a little bit of creativity, and you guys know your students and, and what they are capable of, mm -hmm. uh, where we might be using full sentences, you might be using um, individual vocabulary words or just short sentences, so th they can easily be adapted. Yeah, and I would say, um, actually, you can definitely do project-based learning at low levels, um, and I've done it before, but it does look like maybe more word-based as, as opposed to sentence or paragraph-based. Um, and, you know, we're running out of time here, so we don't have time to fully address it, but I have a ton of ideas for lower level, using TPTs at the lower level, and so I look forward to continuing that conversation um, on the links discussion board. Um, and then the last piece, about that I really love about TPTs is that they allow introverts and extroverts to thrive. And I just came across this really great article called Engaging the Quiet Kids, which I will share in the chat box with you guys, um, and I highly recommend it. But basically it talks about how um, in education we are often, our, our idea of a model student looks like an extrovert, and those are the students that get rewarded. Um, when in reality in your classroom you probably have a lot of introverts too and they're being missed. So TPTs by nature target all of our students no matter what their um, personality type is. Okay, so let's talk a little bit now about what these might look like in your context. So here at Carlos Rosario we have TPT boxes and so all of our teachers have um, a box on each of their table with a variety of different things. And you can really customize your boxes with whatever materials you find um, you find useful. So this is just an example. Um, what is in your box, Cheryl? Um, well, I put the, uh, the ABCD cards in the box. Uh, I have little strips of uh, paper if I want them to do a quick write and uh, we want to do like a lineup. 
Um, uh, also, just something as simple as highlighters. Um, again, oftentimes you're preparing a lesson and you don't think about these little added touches. And right in the middle of the lesson, you think, oh, here would be a good place to for the students to highlight. And instead of like pausing the lesson and getting the basket out and passing around the highlighters, uh, they're all right there in the box on the table. And the students can just pull them out and you can continue with your um, activity pretty seamlessly. So post-it notes, all of these things. I also have scissors and, and um, white out and glue and little things that they, they like to use um, on their own from time to time. <laughs> oh, what are finger fiddles? Not to give your opinion, like in Facebook. <laughs> Although you could use them that way. Um, finger fiddles are just, some people need to keep their hands busy with stuff when they're talking. And I've, I use PPT boxes when I give professional development sessions. Um, and I notice that certain teachers are always grabbing onto the finger fiddles and just moving them around. And it's helpful for some people to occupy their hands. Um, so I like to include some fun stuff too, like finger fiddles and chocolate too. <laughs> um, and just some other ideas for TPT materials. If you can't afford whiteboards, you can do laminated construction paper um, and a dry erase marker. It's a simple white, uh, whiteboard. Um, so just a few tips. Um, if you don't have a classroom of your own, so here at Carlos Cesario, we all have our own classrooms and everybody um, can just store their TPT boxes there. But if you don't have your own classroom, you could give individual students folders with TPT materials. So you could include um, the laminated hold-up cards and you could include you know, a, a highlighter at the bottom if it was a pocket folder. And you could either collect these or have the students bring them to class um, with them every day. And Bridget, to answer your question, uh, yes, we we are teaching adults, adult immigrants. But adults love chocolate and toys, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also find low-cost materials at Target or the dollar store. The Target dollar section is amazing. They have all kinds of fun stuff that you could put in your boxes and a lot of educational materials. Um, you can also use hardware store paint samples which I'm a big fan of ever since I was a little kid. <laughs> but you can, um, you can use these paint samples as stoplight cards. So if you grab a stack of green, a stack of red, a stack of um, uh, yellow, you can use them as checking for understanding cards. You could use the three column paint samples as KWL charts. And you can use paint samples as grouping devices. So everybody that has a blue card is in this group and a green card in this group. Um, and then our last tip is to really start small and just choose a few TPTs to use in the beginning. We don't want to overwhelm you and you don't want to overwhelm your students with introducing a new technique every day. Um, and so just, you know, as you were listening to the techniques in the webinar today, just think about which techniques really resonated the most with you and start there um, and what really would complement your teaching style, I think, too. Um, how many TPTs do you use generally? Uh, basically, I'm using uh, the Quick Write, the Think Pair Share, the the Numbered Heads, and the Chalk Splash. So four, those four are my my go to. Yeah, and like I said, the book has 37. So um, you know, I would totally recommend getting getting a copy of the book and seeing what's in there that you could use. Um, and so this is how I want to end sort of with this quote from the book that says, one of the best, uh, I'm sorry, one of the greatest benefits of TPT infused lessons focused on higher order thinking is that the students whom you would not expect to shine will start shining right alongside the rest of their peers. And this quote really stood out to me because I think every single one of our students is capable of achieving great things. Um, but we don't always offer them the opportunities or the access to, to learning to do that. Um, and so by using a lot of these techniques, you're allowing all of your students to shine, not just the ones that respond to you know, traditional teaching methods, um, so to speak. Um, and so we, Cheryl and I are really looking forward to continuing this conversation with you guys on the um, links discussion board. And so we really want to hear about how you'll use TPTs in your next class. So based on what we uh, talked to you guys about today, 
we'd really love to know what are you going to do with this? How are you going to modify it? I love getting ideas from other educators. Yeah. Um, and we'll make sure to share the templates from our teachers here um, so that you guys have access to all of those um, to all of those resources. Um, and then finally, this is our contact information. So if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out. And then there's also a link to this presentation. And I believe that the webinar will also be, um, it, it was recorded and will be posted on the discussion or 